Hey everyone, today we're taking apart two EVGA GTX 1650s, both of which have power connectors. This first card is the one we reviewed. So we're gonna take this one apart. It's a dual fan cooler. EVGA has done some new things to bring cost down both for them and then obviously for the consumer as well. So this is one of the cheaper dual fan cards EVGA has made in a while. And we're gonna see why that is. What, what did they do to get it cheaper? And did EVGA sacrifice anything in the process of so doing. So we're gonna take this one apart, and we just got this one in today as well, which is a single fan card that's pretty fat. It's two, it's it's like three slots for 1650. So that's what we're gonna look at today. And uh, hopefully we can learn something despite a lot of people not really particularly caring about the six pin power connector 1650s, but we'll look at it anyway. Before that, this video is brought to you by Deepcool's Captain 240 Pro Closed Loop Liquid Cooler. The new Captain 240 Pro comes with RGB illuminated fans and a pump, easily synchronized to each other for color matching in your system. The Captain 240 Pro radiator also uses a unique elastic pressure relief bladder in the water tank as a leak prevention mechanism. It expands and contracts based upon liquid temperature to counteract AIO leak concerns. The cooler is available now, and you can learn more at the link in the description below. This is the EVGA 1650SC Ultra. It's a 90 watt card as opposed to 75 watts. And we'll just Can you get me a bigger one. All right, so we're just going to take this apart. This will be fast, probably. Uh, this one is the one we reviewed and it did well, like as far as, as, as well as a 1650 can do. The appeal of these cards is generally use without a power connector, but this one does have one. It overclocks pretty darn well. We hit 2100 megahertz, sort of, and then uh, 2115 very briefly, but held at 2085, which is a good place to be. And uh, it's only four screws holding down the cooler itself. EVGA does put a sticker covering one of the screws, but it is not a warranty void if removed sticker. It's actually just a, a tamper sticker so they can tell if you've, if they need to replace the paste or something when they RMA it. So yeah, there we go. So very easy to open up. And a couple of things. This card that we have is a PVT model. So this is like a test production run before mass production for consumers. So it doesn't go through some of the processes that a card you would buy would go through, like some of the automatic optical inspection or AOI machines that we've shown in the past would catch this issue, for example. Um, so this is a quality control issue that should not make it to production or mass production because uh, it would be seen by either a person assembling it or by the machine. But these were more or less hand-built for getting them to the press as quickly as possible because NVIDIA didn't give anyone enough time for this product launch. So anyway, yeah, part of the inductor like uh, cover is missing, but that doesn't affect performance or anything. It's, it's basically irrelevant. And then this is an example of what it should look like where it's got the full cap, but that cap doesn't do anything functional that's affecting performance here. It just, just covers the inductor coil. So the rest of this card, pretty simple. Fan goes in there. You've got a big blank area of PCB, but need some, I mean, they had to put something there anyway especially for the fan coverage, the heatsink was gonna be that size. EVJ has done some down cost in unique ways. We'll show you one of those. So here is an example of creative down costing. This is an EVGA 1070. You'll notice that the PCIe slot is fully populated with pins, whereas both of these cards, the 1650s, are missing pins. And that brings cost down a bit, these pins aren't all that useful with something that's got the bandwidth of a 1650, i.e. not high. So that's one way of down costing, but otherwise it's, it's really simple. So it's four one gigabyte memory modules. These are Micron memory modules. And the GPU itself, we might as well look at. So everyone knows what that looks like. All right, good enough. There's the GPU. So that is a TU, TU-117 dash 300 dash A1. That last A1 signifies that it's a production run product, GPU from NVIDIA. And uh, our belief is that this is not a full or fully enabled 
TU-117, so there might be a 1650 Ti if they wanted to do one in the future. It really depends on if there's NVIDIA feels pressure or a reason to. But that's the GPU. It's very small. We can measure the die size in a second. And if you want one of these mod mats that I'm working on, uh, these are our mod mats. We designed these. So this one's a GPU teardown mat. It's got things like uh, capacitor labels on the GPU under here. So you can see we've labeled the uh, the inductors, the MOSFETs, capacitors, all that kind of thing uh, so that you can learn as you go when you do this assembly project. It also protects the surface you're working on and it's got anti-static grounding that goes actually to ground, unlike some of the products out there. And then we have the grid for GPU screw placement. So let's, uh, let's measure the GPU. That's on store.gamersnexus.net if you want to pick up the medium size. It'll be back in stock. Uh, in the next few days and shipping immediately. You can back order it now, it'll ship out. Or the large size is restocking as well, which is the one under the one I'm working on. Roughly 14 and a half millimeters wide, roughly 14 and a half millimeters uh, tall. So the VRM's over here. We have three inductors, We've got the power stages next to it. Another inductor over here, ignoring the damaged one. And on the uh, shunt resistor side, we, so we've got one shunt resistor right here and one down here. This one will run to the 12 volt line in the PCIe slot, and the shunt resistor will probably run to this PCIe connector. So if for some reason you wanted to short these, which would raise your power limit, then you could short this one if you really wanted to. It seems a bit odd, but uh, that'd be what you'd do. And if you want to validate this, you just get a multimeter. You check the shunt leg versus the 12 volt line, and that would tell you which one goes to which power connector. And then we do on these mats, if you need it, have a GPU power pin out. Actually, it's on the medium mat as well. But uh, there's a six pin and an eight pin PCIe power right there. So you'd match it to the 12 volt, which is that yellow block. And that would tell you the correct shunt resistor. So for the back of the card, there's Almost certainly not anything there, but we'll just take the back plate off anyway. EBJ did put a metal back plate on this one. It's $20 more than MSRP, so that's part of that cost. And I will note that originally, when we took this apart, the three of these screws were loose, which wasn't really that exciting to discover. But uh, like before I got them, they were loose. But it's pre-production. It's not mass production, so we'll give EBGA the benefit of the doubt that that was just because it didn't go through the same quality control steps as usual. So you should be good on the consumer side in theory. While we're on that topic too, this was taken apart after the review was completed, all the tests were done, and all the numbers were uh, published. So so this is, we, we don't disassemble before testing. So the back of this is basically blank. There's really nothing going on here. In back of the GPU is pretty obvious, but th this card's very straightforward. So we can move on from the PCB and look instead at the cooler. So what's happening here? Well, this is a cheaper one. As I said, it's down-costed in a few ways. Instead of having a typical aluminum fin stack, EVGA has a blackout matte color, still aluminum sort of fin stack. The fins are very uh, few and far between, but they're good enough. It actually, this card cools pretty damn well. So when we overclocked it, it was still in the 60s, the power, power target seems to be about 60 degrees Celsius, so the fans just spin up to meet that target. But the point here is that uh, it's able to do that with less cooling solution because that GPU is not really doing more than 90 watts for the most part on this card. So you can go 6% uh, above that, but 90 watts about the limit, which doesn't really take a whole lot of cooling power. There's a single heat pipe. This is an eight millimeter heat pipe. You can see that it's a fat cylindrical pipe, which is more effective than the flat ones, but flat ones are often used for GPUs for surface area or just fitment reasons to make sure it fits in the smaller spot. But this one is, uh, is only squared in some areas, so it's not a, not a flat pipe like you would see on some of the other cards. Eight millimeters for that, that goes straight across the middle of the GPU, so you get some contact there. That's your evaporator, and then the liquid will, the water, Pure water will uh, evaporate, go up the pipe, condense, come back down, capillary action, all that stuff we've described before. And then uh, the cold plate itself is an aluminum cold plate. The copper pipe is soldered to it, 
and there's a bit of like small kind of imperfection right here all the way down it's covered with thermal paste in that area right now but that is uh, probably a, a PBT defect as well but either way it cooled fine for the GPU now, the memory is a little bit more concerning but not that much because this card is so low end and there's a lot of airflow above it even though most of it can't get through the card except for right there but the memory will be a, for sure a bit hotter than we typically like to see, and that's because there's no direct contact between the memory and the cold plate. But that does also mean that the cold plate can cool and dissipate more of the heat from the GPU itself. So as long as the memory is within spec, then it's fine. It's it's uh, not running as hot as the GPU is. So these don't sync directly to the cold plate. It's actually we we would like to see some better contact to these for sure, but it's a low end card, and you make cut corners somewhere, and that corner is not particularly important uh, with a model like this. So let's look at the next one. This is the next one. This is the XC. I don't think it's called Ultra. I'm not sure anymore. EBGA does a lot of different things with their names. It's an XC. So this card is a three slot design or basically, I don't know, maybe 2.8, I think it's, no, it's three. They just committed to it this time. So this is actually three slots. That's good to see. Uh, three slot design, single fan. It's larger heatsink will allow it to obviously pull some more of the heat away without needing quite as much active cooling power. So it can keep the fan off for a little bit longer. This is the tamper seal, but it's not a warranty void sticker. That's something we've confirmed a lot. Uh, it's already loose, so only four screws to get these off, which means there's no base plate once again. Okay, cutting it a little close on the thermal paste at the edges. But uh, so anything of note, is this the same PCB? Yep. Oh, actually, there's a great comparison. We are talking about that damaged inductor earlier. If you didn't believe me, there's your evidence. But again, this is just, this card at the top is a mass production model. That's what you would buy. This is a pre-production model. So hopefully that's the only difference there. But uh, either way, same PCB, same VRM layout, same component placement. The difference is the cooler primarily. And let's just clean off the GPU to see if there's anything interesting to reveal, but I don't think there will be. So still TU 117 300A1. Nothing new there. Is it still made in Taiwan? Yes. Are they both in Taiwan? They're both made in Taiwan. So that's uh, going to be TSMC. And then this one has four micron modules as well. So it's all the same. No backplate for this model. And then the cooler is very fat. So. There's the aluminum heatsink versus the two slot card with two fans. This one does not have the heat pipe in it and uh, still doesn't contact the memory, but it does have a bigger aluminum fin stack. It's just that these, I mean, this is typically, this is what you see on these lower end cards where instead of like a proper aluminum heatsink, like maybe this one would have, for example, right there where the fins are either this way or that way. Instead of a proper big aluminum heat sink like that with heat pipes inside of it, you end up with just the aluminum heat sink with no heat pipes in it, and they just do blackout, so it looks a bit better. But that's the design on that one. One fan, the assembly is pretty straightforward. If you wanted to disassemble it to replace the fan, you would pull these screws out. Actually, I don't think you even need to do that. There's a screw right down here. So there's a screw there, there, and over here, you can pull those out and replace the fan, and then the cable would just be routed out through these channels. And then you could separate the shroud from the heatsink by disconnecting the screws right there. So that is the XC, and the other one is the SC Ultra. So that's the two EVGA 1650s that we have. We're probably not gonna look into 1650s too much further. They're not particularly interesting. There's not a lot to learn because we already know the architecture at this point. So it's just a matter of maybe looking at a 75 watt model if we get one, but it's not a, a very high priority for us. But that's the two EVGA cards. If you would like to pick up the mod mat that I worked on during this video or the larger version, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net and back orders will be shipping in the next few days. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to get access to behind the scenes videos. 
Subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.